Hey everyone, praise God, this is Eric Miller. So thankful that you're joining me here today on Revival Cry. You know, I can't believe we're at the end of 2022, about to enter 2023. It's been an amazing year for us, as I'm sure many of you as well. And I really believe that this next year is going to be very different than what we've been experiencing a lot the last two and a half, three years. And I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to really move in power in many of your lives, in local churches, people coming back to gathering, to praying, to seeking the face of God. We're believing God for revival. Thus, that's the name of this podcast and radio program. And yes, I did say radio program. If you're listening to me right now, you might be from Davao City, Philippines, or in the lower region of Mindanao, even in Zamboanga City. And this is our new radio program that we're going to be coming to you twice a week, every Thursday night, 6.30 p.m. to 7 p.m., and on Saturday morning from 6.30 a.m. to 7 a.m. And we're so thrilled to be able to share the gospel, to talk about what Jesus has done in our lives, to bring you interviews with godly men and women from around the world, and of course, local friends, missionaries, pastors, different leaders, people in different aspects of society and culture that God is raising up to shake the nations. Amen. So thank you for listening and joining us. If you would like to find out more about our ministry, I'll share this from the beginning here. You can go to www.revivalcry.org and you can send us an email, info at revivalcry.org. Let us know where you're hearing this from. Maybe you're in another country. Maybe you're right here on the island of Mindanao, but we're so grateful that you're joining us today. I want to get right into the word And I want to open up with a word of prayer. Amen. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Jesus, for your powerful word. Lord, that you've touched us this entire year and have done so many things, God, that we know and so many other things that maybe we have no clue until we get to heaven one day. But Lord Jesus, we invite your presence. And as we open your word today, that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you today about reacting or responding to Jesus. Bill Johnson once said, Jesus did not react to the devil. He lived in response to the Father. Jesus did not react to the devil. He lived in response to the Father. You remember when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil for all these different things that he was trying to get him to do so that he would submit to any authority the enemy had, but Jesus was already submitted to his father. There was never a moment that he wasn't submitted because he never sinned. He was always living holy and he was perfect. And so he constantly lived in response to his father, despite the challenges that came from the outside, from the enemy, from other works of darkness, from political figures, even from within his own family. And the disciples that he poured his life into, Jesus never reacted. He always responded. This is our example that you and I are to follow. You know, there's a chart that if you can't see me right now, I'll explain it to you. But if you want to watch this podcast or radio program, you can always go to our YouTube channel and search for Revival Cry with Eric Miller and subscribe there so that you can get these videos every week when we put them up. But a woman named Heather Gillis has a chart that she made and I'm gonna show this on the screen. It's called the difference between react and respond. Those who react are impulsive. They're out of their emotions and their fear, they react, right? They're normally short-sighted. They can't see beyond their issues, their problems, their cares and concerns. Those who react are 
immediate. You know, they got to do something right now. They can't think. They, they feel tension and, you know, pressure. Other people who react are irrational. They're not being clear about what they should do, the decisions they make. But people who respond are always intentional. They always have purpose behind what they do. They respond out of love and respect in life that no matter what is thrown at them, they're going to focus on the word of God being their anchor to help them to think through and know what to say, what not to say. Uh, people who respond, they see the bigger picture long term. They don't get caught up in the small moment of some issue but they think, okay, I know God's hand is upon my life. I'm intimately walking with Jesus. And so I'm just going to trust him with all of my heart, not lean to my own understanding, right? But in all my ways, acknowledge him. And he's going to make my path straight because I've got a bigger picture. And other people who respond, they respond delayed. Not, not delayed in the sense of not walking in the spirit, but they're... They're just not in a rush. They're patient. They're delayed in the world, but they're right in step with the Holy Ghost. And they know that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding dwells in their hearts and their minds. And as your mind gets renewed in Christ, you want to do what only you see the Father doing, just like what Jesus did. We want to be responders, not reactors, right? And lastly, there are people who respond are self-controlled. These folks are not going to allow life or trials, temptation, hardship, anything to keep them from focusing on the Word of God and what God's plan is for their life. Amen. You know, when someone would come to Jesus, we, you know, we read about in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They either chose to respond to him or react to him. But we know that Jesus is not looking for reactors. He's looking for responders to what he's done for us. You know, we call a nuclear power plant a reactor. <laughs> you know, and they're highly guarded and dangerous because if they were to explode... I mean, it could cause massive damage and loss of life. But think about how we are, we respond to the Lord or we react to our problem instead of responding to the Lord and how that can go nuclear at times, right? It can affect relationships. You know, words come out of, maybe you're a parent or maybe, you know, your parents spoke to you in a tone that was, you know, just quick and not thinking, being clear about what they wanted to do and helping loving correction come about in your life, but they just reacted instead of responded. You see, that's not helpful. How we respond to the Lord is so important because Jesus must be Lord of our lives. He must be the ruler of what we say, of what we do, and what we think. In James 2.20 it says, but do you not know, O foolish men, that faith without works is dead? You see, it's easy for us to react to what Jesus has done for us. It's easy. Who wouldn't want eternal life? Who wouldn't want God to change their life? Who wouldn't want the blessing of eternity in heaven with God forever or abundant life? All of these things, those are all reactions that people give oftentimes when they're presented with the opportunity of accepting Jesus or, uh, you know, following the Lord, becoming a disciple. But we know that when we put our faith in God, that as much as we are justified by our faith, that the evidence of our faith is our good works. I'm not saying our good works save us, I believe it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ that we are saved, that we are separated from sin, that we are born from above, right? Because of what Jesus has done for us. But, but here's the deal. If your heart and your mind is changed, then what happens? You're going to want to do what's right. It, it, you're going to talk differently. 
You're going to not allow your mind to wander and be full of lustful thoughts and anger and, you know, uh, cursing and unforgiveness and bitterness. Those things will not control you anymore because you are now transformed. And transformed people, it's obvious. They don't just go to church. They have good works that represents what their real faith is. God's not only looking for people who trust him when it is beneficial to them. He's looking for people who will respond to him as if he is all that they had. Is Jesus all that you have? You see, this is what we're talking about. So many people re react to God. Of course, I want all these benefits, but they don't respond. It's like the difference between a believer and a disciple. Anybody can believe that Jesus is Lord. Even the demons believe that Jesus is Lord. But how we respond to him says if I'm going to be a disciple. If I'm going to live holy for God when nobody else is looking. Whether anybody knows my name or not, I know that he knows my name. He knows the number of hairs on my head. I am sold out to the Lord. I want to read from John 12 verses 1 through 19 about people who responded or reacted to Jesus after Lazarus was raised from the dead. Do you remember that story? So in John chapter 12, starting in verse 1, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was who, he, who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. In the prior chapter, he just raised Lazarus from the dead, right? There, they made him a supper, and Martha served. Sounds familiar. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was the fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it for himself, basically. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this day for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but me you will not always have. So I, I want to look at these first, you know, three, four people here, or f let's say five people. First of all, we see that Martha responded to Jesus differently than when before she saw Lazarus raised from the dead. You remember the story, you know, uh, Jesus comes to the house of Mary and Martha and she's busy she's cooking she's cleaning and she and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus while he's talking and and she's just at peace and she's listening she's an intimate posture before the Lord just I want to hear your voice I want to know what you're saying God and Martha's so busy and she says Lord why don't you get Mary to help me I'm so busy doing all these things and I'm I'm obviously I'm just you know summarizing this but Jesus responds to Martha. He wasn't angry that she was busy, but he was trying to show her the difference between reacting to him and responding to him. Martha, Martha, you're busy and worried about many things, but Mary chose what is better. You see, Martha's faith was dependent upon her good works, but Mary's faith was about to produce good works that we're going to read about how she responds to Jesus in a different manner. But now, after Lazarus had been raised from the dead, Martha had seen this incredible miracle. She was upset. She said, Jesus, if you were here, my brother would never have died. But Jesus makes it clear that I'm the resurrection to life. If you believe in me, I'm, I'm telling you, if you put your faith in me, Jesus is saying... I'm not only going to raise him from the dead, but I'm going to raise your faith from the dead. I'm going to cause you to respond to me, to stop reacting to me in life, but respond to me. And then we look at Lazarus, how he responded to Jesus. It says that Lazarus, 
who was just raised from the dead, is sitting at the table eating with Jesus. A man who was dead for, what, three days? And he's stinking. Jesus has removed the stone. He calls him out of the grave. He said, take the, the grave clothes off of him, loose him, let him go. And he is alive. That's a picture of what it's like when we come to Christ. Is Jesus takes off the old life from us and, and renews us and, and makes us alive in him. And now we can have intimate fellowship with him where we eat you know, a meal with Jesus. You know, everything that we do in life, even the most simple things, Jesus is interested in us as his disciples. And could you imagine, he must have been so grateful to even be alive, to be listening to Jesus, knowing that he was dead and have all these witnesses. And then we read about Mary. It says here that she responded to Jesus in a deeper worship than what she originally responded. I go back to that story again. Mary chose what was better. This is before Lazarus died and, and was risen, uh, resurrected from the grave. That Mary chose what was better while Martha was busy. And while Mary is reacting or responding to the Lord in that way of faith, it actually prepared the way for her in her life so that now that after she sees Lazarus, her brother, raised from the dead, she only has one attitude, and that's to go deeper in worship. I'm going to take my most expensive oil, perfume, and I'm going to pour it on the feet of my Lord and my Savior, my God, and I'm going to wash his feet with my hair. See, this is how we go deeper with the Lord, my friend. If you're so busy reacting to the Lord all the time, you're never going to know what it means to go deeper in worship. But if you continually respond, respond, respond to the Lord and just allow him to sift your heart and train you up in the way you should go, I'm telling you, you're going to know what to do in every situation in life. Instead of reacting, you're going to be a responder. You know, that's what we call... You know, people who work in ambulances, right, and and help people get into accidents and things like that. Uh, firefighters, right, uh, EMTs. We call them first responders. You know why they're first responders? Because they're ready. If you're constantly reacting to God, you're not going to be ready when God needs you to be ready. And God wants you to be a responder so that you're ready in season and out of season. So that when there's situations of where you can help others and represent Jesus well to them, then you're going to be a responder who is on the scene. When God needs you to lead somebody to Jesus, make a disciple, pray for the sick, see them recover, you know, give and bless somebody and open your house and your life to that individual. This is what it looks like. And then we, we read about Judas, you know. Judas isn't responding anymore. He's reacting. He's reacting to Jesus with a poverty mentality. And we know that because he was living in sin while he was walking with Jesus. Could you imagine? We, you know, all of us say uh, a lot of times, you know, if I saw Jesus, I would believe and, and I wouldn't give up and I would be faithful and all this stuff. Here's a fact of the matter. Judas saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Judas saw blind eyes open. Judas saw demons come out of people. Judas saw all of these miracles, signs and wonders, you know, water turned into wine. I mean, there were so many incredible things that he saw Jesus do. And then what happens? He's taking the money on the side. Friend, there might be somebody listening to me today. Maybe you're in church. Maybe you're on the church treasury team and you're stealing money. And the pastor has no clue. And you, in your mind, you think it's okay, but you have no accountability. And you're doing it because you serve and you work so hard, you think you deserve it. Oh, my friend. You see, responders are accountable people, not reactors. Responders are people who say, you know, this isn't my money. This is the Lord's money. And they walk by faith. Whether they have a lot or have a little, they learn to be content with the Lord in all things. Judas was not content. And we know eventually it's revealed that he is a, a thief 
and a traitor. The most probably well-known traitor in the history of humanity because he tried to deceive the Lord. He deceived the other disciples. Jesus knew all along. But even then, Jesus always gave him a chance to respond and to stop reacting. Let's read on a little bit in the scripture. In verse 9, it says, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not only for Jesus' sake, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he has raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So here we are. We, we've talked about Martha, Lazarus, uh, Mary, and Judas. But here we got the Jewish leaders, the, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders. And they are not responding to Jesus. They are reacting to his miracles. And it says that they wanted to even get a look at Lazarus. But because they're so intimidated by the fear of what others are saying around them, that this is a false prophet, that he is not the Messiah. And, you know, he's uh, the Messiah is going to save us from the tyranny of Rome. They had their lives only focused on the temporary and not the eternal. You see, if they were focused on the eternal, they would have recognized that the way that Jesus lived his life was in response, not in reaction to the pressure, to the hardship, to the challenges around them. Jesus was willing to endure a cross, to be whipped and beaten, to, do, to be despised and rejected by men. Because he was a reactor and he was trying to teach you and I how we are to respond to him. We're not supposed to be like religious leaders who just react to everything. Who just, you know, come up with their own reasoning of why it's okay for them to sin. See, friend, it's never okay to sin. And sin separates us from God. And God wants us to know that the entire reason why Jesus came was to restore us back to the heart of the Father. And lastly, let's read about the multitude starting in verse 12 through 19. It says, The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel! Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it. As it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out from his tomb and raised him from a dead, bore witness. There was a mix of people responding and reacting. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So some people reacted because he did a sign. They weren't responding to their need for the Lord. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look! The whole world has gone after him. <laughs> I love it. You see, the multitude reacted to Jesus saving them from their trouble, but did not respond until he was resurrected. All of those people, even his own disciples, were just as evil as the religious leaders. We all crucified Jesus, Jews, Gentiles. We all put him on that cross because we all originally reacted to him. We want to come to Jesus to see what, how he could benefit us. We want to come to Jesus for fitting him in our lives. Friend, we don't fit Jesus into our lives. He's not only our Savior, but he has to be Lord. He has to be our master. Paul even said, I want to be a bond servant, a slave of God. Now, when we come to Jesus, when we're saved from our sin, we're no longer slaves. So why would Paul say, I want to be a slave? Well, he wasn't saying I want to be a slave of sin anymore. I want to be a slave of righteousness. I want to hide my life in Christ. I want to respond to him in a way, the way that he responded to the sin in my life. See, friend, imagine if God reacted to you and I the way that we sinned. He didn't. He responded in love. 
He responded in brokenness. He responded by laying his own life. This is the gospel. He laid his life down. You know, I was reading a scripture in Zechariah 10 verse 8. And I'm going to read it here in just a moment. And I, have you ever, I don't know if you had a parent in the U.S. where I grew up, you know, sometimes parents would come outside and they would whistle. And I don't have a good whistle. <laughs> it's really kind of weak. But, you know, we whistle to get the attention of somebody really loud. Have you ever had somebody do that for you? You know, I, I know some of my friends' parents, they would whistle so loud, it would get your attention. And we got to go. It's time to go home, right? I believe before the Lord returns, he's going to whistle to get the attention of his people. Zechariah 10 verse 8 says, I will whistle for them and gather them. I will redeem them and they shall increase as they once increase. You see, I believe God is whistling over the world right now. He's saying, stop reacting to COVID. Start responding to me. Start listening to my small, still voice. Stop listening to the world. Stop allowing politicians and other religious people or even the dictates of your own heart to keep you from me. He says, respond to my word. Respond to my love for you. Recognize that I could have destroyed and judged the world and been totally righteous. But why did he put a, a rainbow over the ark after Noah and his family were saved, he put a rainbow to remind himself and the world that he's never going to destroy the world again. See, Jesus didn't give his life for us to be destroyed. He gave his life so that we might be saved, so we might be transformed, so we might be healed, so we might be delivered, so we might walk in freedom, my friend. Are you listening to the whistling of the Lord? Are you hearing God's heart cry out to you? Listen, you are loved, my friend. And I want to tell you something. When we realize he's responded to us and not reacted to us, it will cause us to respond to the hunger that we hear in other people the way that Jesus responded to our hunger in our hearts. God's calling us to come to him to lay our life down and to say, Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. Maybe as you're listening to me today, you're thinking, most of my Christianity, I've been a reactor. I've not been a responder. I look at the fruit from my life and I see anger. I see lust. I, I, I see control. I see you know, harsh words coming out of my mouth. I see a love of money, a love of this world. My friend, Jesus gave his life so that you and I could walk in freedom, so that we could be holy, so that we could produce the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You see, these fruits are what he promises for the believer. I want to encourage you today. Will you lay down being a reactor and say, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. I want you to lay your, I want you to give, take my heart, Jesus, and, and make it brand new. Make me holy. Would you pray with me right now? Father God, here I am. I've been a reactor. But today, I choose to be a responder. I choose to give myself over to you the way you gave yourself for me. I'm not going to run from you anymore. But I'm going to stop and be still and know that you are God. So in the name of Jesus, take my heart, take my mind, take my life, everything that's important to me. I lay it at your feet. And I ask that you would use me for your glory, Lord. For it is in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. And amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer... I believe God responds to faith. He does. And he wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He wants to empower you to live a, a life separated and devoted to him. Listen, friend, I want to encourage you. God loves you and he has a plan for your life. Wherever you go to church, 
get discipled. Go after God. If, if, if you don't have a local church, then find a church that's on fire for God, that preaches the word of God, that, that sees the glory of the Lord manifesting, the power of God, lives are changing, there's testimonies. And I promise you, you'll grow. Be planted in the Lord and, and your whole life will change. He'll change your marriage. He'll change your family. He'll change the entire direction of your life. Listen, thank you so much for listening today. I want to encourage you, go to our website, revivalcry.org. Write us at info at revivalcry.org and stay in touch. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and go to our YouTube channel. Follow us. We love you guys and we're proud of you. Be a responder and not a reactor in the name of Jesus. God bless you today.